Uh, let's go ahead and talk about politics in the big city. We've talked about some of the problems faced by the big city. We've talked about immigration um, and, and what led to all that. So once everybody got into the cities, how did they try to get along? How did they live together? And that's basically uh, what politics is all about, trying to live together as a society. And, and what are the rules by which you operate uh, and deciding what those are? In, in the big cities, the, the politics uh, became dominated by what were called political machines. Uh, a political machine wasn't a literal machine. It was really an organization that controlled local politics. And they did this through the, what was called the ward system. The wards would be subdivided into precincts and the precincts into blocks. And uh, what would happen is the wards would be controlled by a political boss uh, who would go ahead and, and talk to uh, his precinct captains and his block captains. And these guys would go out and they would go ahead and, and try to support of their local friends on their block or in their precinct. And they would do this by promising favors. Hey, if you go ahead and vote for so-and-so, uh, we'll go ahead and promise that you'll get this or your your uncle will get a job or, or whatever. Uh, and so they would make sure to go ahead and, and get votes that way. Uh, and until this day, in fact, political machines dominate the landscape of a lot of the, America's larger cities, places like Chicago, places like New York, to this day, have active political machines. The most notorious of the 1800s was a machine called Tammany Hall. It was active in New York. It was the Democratic political machine, and in fact, political machines are kind of unique to the Democratic Party. You really don't ever hear of Republican machines. Um, and uh, the most notorious of the leaders of the, the of Tammany Hall was a guy by the name of William Marcy Tweed. He put together what was called the Tweed Ring. It was a group of corrupt politicians who owed their election to William Marcy Tweed. And so as a result, they would go ahead and give him bribes, give him kickbacks, uh, make sure that certain business came his way. So even though William Tweed was never an elected was never really an elected official in New York, he controlled New York because he was a political boss. Um, although these types of practices in politics uh, weren't unique to, to the local level. There are certainly... Uh, corrupt practices even up at the federal level. A great example of that, uh, both at the local and the federal, was the, the idea of patronage, where you would give government jobs to friends. This, again, mayors would do this and presidents would do this. It was prominent throughout American politics in the 19th century, and some could probably argue that it's it's prominent today. Uh, at the presidential level, you had something uh, that were patronage was practice called the spoils system, uh, where the winning candidate for president would basically appoint a whole new set of government officials all across the landscape. Whereas now when presidents come in, the bureaucrats pretty much stick around. Back in the day, the, the, the president would basically clean house in the entire government and he'd appoint a whole new group uh, and they'd all come in. Uh, and he'd, he'd give these out to friends and uh, to people who, who would help him during his run for the office. Uh, some of the reforms then, uh, there was a series of presidents uh, during the late 1800s that were trying to reform this practice and try to reform the way this worked. One such president was a guy by the name of Rutherford B. Hayes. Uh, he initiates what's called the civil service reform, and he's going to go ahead and try to not have it where, hey, we're, we're handing these positions, these offices out to friends. Rather, we have, we're recruiting candidates who are qualified for the job, and, and those jobs are guaranteed, and, uh, and it, it really begins the way our government works today. Uh, he investigates customs houses. Some of the best jobs you could get were customs officials because back in the day, all of our all of our income came in through customs houses. And so there's a lot of money going through customs houses. And so oftentimes they were corrupt. Uh, Rutherford B. Hayes fires the customs house officials, uh, gets rid of them, and tries to go ahead and replace that whole system. Another guy was a guy by the name of James Garfield. Um, he was an Ohio congressman. He was politically not really a Democrat or Republican. He was kind of independent. Uh, but he was assassinated in 1881. Uh, a guy comes up to him, a uh, guy uh, by the name of Charles Goutier, uh, and he goes ahead and shoots him in the, uh, in the subway there. And uh, Garfield actually survives the shooting, uh, and he's killed just as much because of inept doctors as he was because of, of Goutier. He dies later from his wounds. Uh, but his vice president then takes over, uh, takes over for Garfield. Uh, and, and ironically enough, Chester A. Arthur was one of the officials who was fired under Hayes, and now he becomes president. And so everybody who had elected Garfield wanted him to reform this whole thing, the customs houses and, and, and all this patronage and all, all these different things and all, all the, the spoil system. And they were afraid, oh, great, now here we go. Chester Arthur, one of the officials who was fired. But I think to everybody's surprise, Chester A. Arthur turns out to be a pretty reform-minded president. Uh, and he goes ahead and enacts a lot of, a lot of the reforms that really... Um, uh, uh, that really Garfield was elected to, to imp implement. Uh, Grover Cleveland is another one who takes on reforms. He takes on particular tariffs. Uh, he's, he's unique as president because he's the only president who serves two non-consecutive terms in our nation's history. In other words, 
he is elected president, he loses his bid for re-election, and four years later, he comes back and wins again. Uh, and he's only, the only president to do that. Uh, the guy who kind of uh, interrupts him is a guy by the name of Benjamin Harrison. Uh, he's the grandson of William Henry Harrison, who had also been a president of the United States. Uh, and he won with a minority of the popular vote. It's happened, it's happened before. Uh, it'll happen again, where sometimes presidents win with 49% of the vote or whatever. It doesn't happen a lot, but it does happen. And he raises tariffs. Uh, and then after Grover Cleveland's reelected, he serves for a time, William McKinley becomes president after Cleveland's second term, and he raises tariffs even further, uh, which proves to be uh, a difficult and begins really a trade war uh, and turns out to be a negative policy.